This All Saints Day falls in the week in which we honor our veterans. And so it is our practice and our, our, our practice each year that when we come to this time, I invite those who have served in the United States military to please rise. Would you please stand for all our veterans? We thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. As you know, a number of years ago, Adam Wade fixed the wall, the wall of honor in the back of the sanctuary, back in the southwest corner. And there is a book there. And I ask you to put the names, this is for anyone, but I ask you to write the names of your beloved ones who have served our nation through the years. Uh, it is a book I go to and pray in, and I hope others do as well. But again, let us never forget them. Uh, there are a number who are lifted up in today's service who are veterans, and so we're also very mindful of their service to our country as well. I invite you now, as we turn to this time, to uh, prepare for... The, day, the moments ahead, and there's something else I need to share before we begin. Today we will lift up the memory of 12 beloved members of this church who together lived 1,025 years of life and love on this planet, an average of 85.4 years. That's a lot of love and living. So with thanks be to God for all of them, and they are dearly beloved to us. Last year, in this room, on this day, it was just Mark and Emily and me and Kevin, our soloist, and Peter Murray in the live stream room next to us. And we held this service, and it was all wrong. It was all wrong. So I would ask that those who uh, could not be here in person last year but lost loved ones between November 1, 2019 and November 1, 2020. Please stand. We missed that time and the memory, and I will read their names aloud. Would you please stand as you hear the name of your family member? James Arnold Fulis, Richard H. Keevan. I would say if you're home, stand at home too. Benjamin F. Wyant. Patricia Likert Pullman, Margaret Crosby Alexander, Carl Edward Miller, Joan Marguerite Larson Liebold, Arlene Flocken Reynolds, Antonio M. Tony Carroll, uh, Ron Bott's wife, and I let Ron know he's leading worship in Dublin Presbyterian today, but we remember her. Dr. Willard Fernald, and Dr. Lawrence W. Walquist, Jr. We remember them, and we will never forget them, and their memories are for us a blessing, and their light shines as light eternal. Thank you. Again, I want you to hear these words from Mary in John 11:32, from the J.B. Phillips translation of the Bible. When Mary met Jesus, she looked at him, and she fell down at his feet, and she said, if only you had been here, my brother would never have died. If only. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. <clears throat> In a scene near the end of the opera Hamilton, Philip Hamilton, Eliza and Alexander Hamilton's oldest son, 19 years old, dies in a pistol duel defending his father's name and reputation. The grief that ensues for his father and mother is unimaginable. Unless you are a parent who has suffered the death of a son or daughter, you may not grasp 
the power and the gravity of that unimaginable grief. As they sing this song, it's quiet uptown, we hear this phrase, there are moments that the words don't reach. There's a grace too powerful to name. We push away what we can never understand. We push away the unimaginable. All Saints Day feels like this as we remember those whom we have loved and who loved us and are now gone. This unimaginable feeling, this feeling that the moments that words can't reach, this is the moment where grace is too powerful to name. And we push away what we don't understand, what we can never understand. We push away the unimaginable. Martha and Mary are feeling that unimaginable feeling this morning as they suffer grief following the death and burial of their brother Lazarus. He was too young to die. And he had died four days before Jesus' arrival. The funeral was over. The body was in the cave decomposing. As Jesus enters Bethany, Mary can't keep herself still anymore. She cries out to the approaching Jesus, if only you had been here, my brother would never have died. We're not sure of Mary's tone as she spoke to her friend as well as her savior. Was she pleading? Was she bargaining? Was she angry about his seemingly late arrival? Was she whispering in grief that couldn't find words aloud? Was she simply stating the facts, the truth of the matter? Jesus would never have allowed her brother to die. Whatever the case, Jesus is deeply moved and troubled to tears by the distress and Mary, of Mary's pain and if onlys. He goes to the tomb, to the cave. He steps into the stink. He raises Lazarus to new life. And Mary is right. The unimaginable of Mary's if only comes true. Like Mary, we have all faced the unimaginable. And we gather today to remember that feeling, to reach deeply into that feeling. Our faces writhed in pain as we ache at times for the unimaginable loss we've gone through. Our tears have flowed until they dried up. For those close to our loved ones, their breaking has broken us as well. We melt in the trauma of the if-onlys together. Unlike Lazarus, there will be no physical rising from the dead. Our loved ones are not coming back from the tomb. But like Mary and Jesus, the unquenchable pain of distress has brought us to our knees. Our if-onlys rise up. If only we could go down to the grave with people and crumble with them there. If only we could be more human when people reach their lowest point and we fail to be as present as we want to be. If only we could enter into the pain of the others when they need us most. If only we were like Jesus and could see the wonder of what God can do. If only we could, like Jesus, be miracle workers and say, now unbind him and let him go home. If only. We do what we can do in the face of the unimaginable. We remember we can do that together. Today we remember with great love the nine men and three women who have entered eternal life from our congregation in this past year. They were amazing witnesses of our faith on earth and are now true saints of God in heaven. They are resting in the eternal promises of God's love. Their losses are personal. Their lives touch us deeply and we will remember them now and always. Paul Santilli was a true son of Columbus, Ohio. He was born here in 1929, and here he received his degree in chemical engineering from the Ohio State University, and then went on to gain his law degree from Capital University 
From there, he went on to serve as vice president and general counsel at Battelle Institute, and then vice president and secretary of the Battelle Development Corporation. Also, he served our nation faithfully and well in the Air Force during the Korean War. And Paul loved, he loved hiking and traveling and reading and golfing most of all. But more than anything, Joanne, he loved you. He loved you more than anything. You were his love and his light for 63 years and your family too. David Majors for years and years could be found each week in worship seated next to his best friend, Nell Cole, right back there. He loved the music of First Church. He would come for the concerts. He loved the choir. He worked in, at Columbia Gas and here in, in uh, Columbus at Franklin County Board of Elections for years and years. He also took up real estate as a second career and that kept him out of trouble. That was good. Otherwise, he enjoyed finding antiques and watching classic films. He would come in talking about movies that were like so old, I didn't know they even were made. And if you ever saw him at his happiest, he was driving his drag wires with his black poodles, Baron and Max. The Reverend Dr. Herbert Goetz was a pastor of the United Church of Christ for more than 60 years. He served 30 remarkable years as a Navy captain in the Chaplain's Corps with duty stations above ships, aboard ships, and with the Marine Air Group across the globe. He was a Vietnam veteran and saw two years of combat where he often was taking care of men unto death. He is now buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Following retirement from active duty, Herb didn't stop working. He volunteered as a chaplain for the ROTC at Ohio State and then the U.S. Navy League and served as Director of Religion and Education at Lakeside Chautauqua. He was the Executive Minister at First Community Church and came to me and told me that I needed uh, an associate pastor, which I didn't have at the time, and he said, I will be that person as an interim until you get one. That was Herb. He didn't actually ask. He just told me it was going to happen. So. That's the way it was. And he served in many interims in small congregations as well. In his life story, for such a time as this, he writes his desire to share the love of God like this. It was a need to respond to the void in humankind, to an emptiness known or unknown, by acting in a spirit of acceptance and love and remembering my humanness as, as I ministered to humans, as humans in service to our God. And he was here every Christmas day at Bethlehem on Broad Street for years and years. I think he was the chaplain for everything. <laughs> Herb was always large and in charge. And he was my friend. I wear his stole today to remember him. Dana Navin Schultz was remembered and celebrated in a beautiful service here just last month, 10 months after her death. Now, it's never too late to hold a memorial service. And in COVID time, some of us have just given up, but Hugh didn't give up and we had her service. Hugh told me Dana was related to everyone in central Ohio. And if she wasn't related to them, they were her friends. <laughs> so, it's true, she was a friend to all. And her mantra was, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Her life of service and love was lived out at the Art Museum and WOSU Public Radio, Pro Music of First Church, no matter where she went, she loved others and cared. She listened. She once went down in the kitchen, Jan, you'd appreciate this. She was down in the kitchen of First Church, and she said, Hugh, roll up your sleeves. We're going to be here for a few hours because it needed a good cleaning. And she did it. She was one to serve all the time. Janet Lee Younger was a member of First Church for 20 years. She was an amazing woman. She was an artist who served our larger community at the King Arts Complex for many, many years. She was a compassionate and kind servant of God, and she was really funny. She grew up in the home of a black Baptist preacher, and she always loved coming here because she told me the beauty of the sanctuary and the shortness of the services really attracted her. <laughs> I told you she was funny, so I better deliver on the second part <laughs> anyway. She was amazing, and she loved and lived fully in this life, loving God and her neighbor every day of her life. Born and raised in Denver, Colorado, 
Dr. Dick Ward was an accomplished surgeon and one of the founding partners of Orthopedic One. He served our country in the Air Force as a surgeon and then came to Columbus where he stayed after he arrived. He was an accomplished orthopedic surgeon, but if you asked him what mattered most in his life, he would tell you it was winning the 1950 Colorado State High School broad jump title with a record 22 feet, eight and a half inches, and you always got the distance. And then it was his hostas, with which he registered approximately 200 cultivars, including one named after Alice Gladden, for which he was awarded the highest honors for his accomplishment and would speak with love about it. But his greatest love was you, my dear. He loved Jane. He loved her dearly. And he loved coming to worship with her. Every time they were here, he was smiling. The Honorable John D. Martin was a distinguished judge, but I will always remember him in book studies at the trustees and at worship at First Church. I loved his sweater. I think he had one. <laughs> he was funny, he was engaging, he was quiet, he was brilliant, he was thoughtful. I told Kay that I always thought John reminded me of Abraham Lincoln, the way he carried himself with such distinction and humility as he would go about practicing the law. And as a judge serving in Lancaster, he was there for more than 40 years serving in the law and the fifth generation of Martins to do that in Lancaster. But his greatest love and joy was you, my dear. It was Kay. He loved to support Kay and their family and cheer them on. You could find him on a sideline or perhaps beside a court clapping and cheering louder than anybody else. And he loved being a volunteer in the community and in the library in Upper Arlington in the last years. Lindy Miller was a character. Now, I just want to say, in the best sense of the word, he was a character. Anyone who knew him knew this. And in the dictionary, it should say in the next edition, character, Lindy Miller. I knew Lindy for 32 years. As he was approaching 90, and in failing health, he told me, the doctor came in today and asked me if I had a do not resuscitate order. I told the doctor that they have to resuscitate me until my 90th birthday, which is June 7th, and then they can do whatever they want. <laughs> Those are his exact words. And he lived to June 7th and then to, June, to July 8th when he died. He was a veteran of this country and served his country faithfully and well. No one knew the Buckeyes better than Lindy Miller. He once told me, Joe Burrows is the best quarterback ever to come out of Ohio, ever, and he will win the Heisman Trophy one day. Now you have to remember, he told me this when Joe was in middle school. He was smart, creative, playful, funny, fun, just a joy to be with, and he was a devout Republican reminding me always of the great values of the Republican Party. He never wasted a moment not telling me about them, but he stopped talking in 2016. He loved his whole family, and he had friends across the world, many of whom he outlived. I miss him every day. Bill Bowden died in Idaho in July with his beloved Alice and his family by his side. He was 86 years old. But Bill was Ohio born and bred. He grew up on a farm in Hilliard, Ohio, and his family were active members of First Church from his age of six, so over 80 years. He and his family were dedicated members of this church, and he joined the children's choir at First Church when he was six, and he discovered he had a talent for singing, and he kept coming back. He sang in the First Church choir until he moved to Idaho, a number of years ago, till he was 73 years old. As well, he sang in glee clubs and quartets and continued out in Idaho to do the same thing. He was kind and gentle and thoughtful and loving and positive as a school counselor in Bexley and uh, through the years as an educator. He influenced so many lives so well and so positively. And he learned that all, he said, from the pulpit of First Church. Reverend Dr. Boynton Merrill was his inspiration in life. He even went to seminary for a year because Dr. Boynton encouraged him to do it. Dr. Chuck Drummond 
was active in First Church for many, many years. He was an avid Buckeyes fan, and when he retired to Florida, he would work it out so he'd come to two home games, two Saturdays in a row, and come to church in between. He was a professor of glass science in the ceramic engineering and material science departments for 36 years and won the student's favored teacher award in engineering several times. He was a great baker, too. He was legendary for his pies and cakes, and he even perfected pie crusts, which were tricky. And then when I was talking with Robert, his life partner of 45 years this week, Rob told me that they had celebrated their last day on earth together 15 years before. They'd spent a day planning what it would be like, and it was good they did, because Chuck's last day on earth was awful. And Robert remembers how fast he went before his eyes. And so he encouraged me to encourage you to celebrate somewhere in your life together with those that you love your last day on earth. And don't wait. Do it now. Helen Spears was 96 years young when the Lord took her into as a jewel in his crown. She loved life and art and all of us. And she was remembered in her service here on October 20th as one who had this amazing spirit and kindness and gentleness. She was active here for more than 45 years and served here in so many ways, in book studies, Bible studies, travels to the Holy Land as a deacon in music ministry search committee and the art committee, and those are just a few. She just loved serving here, and anyone who knew her loved her quiet, kind voice which always call, called us to do better and be better. And it was true, that's the way she lived. And George West, I'll remember him sitting with you, Gary, for the rest of my days. For the five years that the two of you came to worship, you came every Sunday that you could. And I, you always blessed us in your time here together. And he, as long as I knew him, it was impossible to believe, but he always had a smile. He always had a step that had a jump in it. He always had joy, and he was kind and loving. He, he came from Canada, having served in the Canadian Army, and was a veteran there. And as he was, a, he was a proud Canadian, I think that's fair, fair to say. But he was always curious and loved exploring and learning more about the world. He was a lifelong learner and a true and dedicated man to the Freemason movement which he took with him all the days of his life. I never knew him before 90, but I also never knew him to have a day without a smile and joy. I ask all of the families of the 12 that I have named to please stand, families and friends that are here today, please stand. We thank you for the love that you shared with your loved ones and for the amazing gifts that they gave to all of us. They made this world a better place, and you know better than I. So thanks be to God for each one of them, and for the ways that they lived and loved with all. Thank you for being here. In finishing up, I just want to say something. Author Frederick Buechner has written, in God's holy flirtation with the world, God occasionally drops a handkerchief. These handkerchiefs, the Lord calls saints. You see, it's God's business to make saints, not ours. We can do all the declaring we want, but it's God's work to strive to show us the way of amazing grace and love and to drop these delicate handkerchiefs into our lives. The saints of God are real. They're not imaginary friends. They're real people. And today we push back the unimaginable just a bit, and we remember them again, our loved ones. We remember them. They were ordinary men and women whose love of God led them to become extraordinary men and women. And they're here with us now. They're here in spirit. I feel them. All of the 12 saints of God have touched our lives, and so together I would like us to say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.